All right. Well, good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're located. I would like to welcome all of you to today's NUG community call. The date is June 20th, 2024. Hope everyone is having a wonderful week. And let's go ahead and kick things off uh, with today's schedule of events or pipeline. We'll start off with a couple of general nurse announcements and updates um, to keep you updated on everything that is going on at NURSE. And then we have two actual exciting talks today from uh, our postdoctoral uh, fellow in NESAP, uh, Mikkel Dave, who is going to give us two exciting talks on his work in wind energy simulations, as well as improvements to Kudo Wear MPI on Perlmuter. Okay, um, if you have any questions or comments throughout um, today's talk, uh, feel free to, or throughout the announcements, feel free to interject or add your thoughts. Um, and we'll let uh, Dr. Dave decide how he wants to handle questions during his talks. And so a few announcements and updates that we have going on here at NURSE. Um, couple of um, updates. Uh, we have a big job discounts that are going on on Perlmuter. So in the NURSE 2024 allocation year, if you're running jobs um, using um, 128 nodes or more um, and CPU um, using 20, 256 or more, we're offering uh, reduced discounts on those job costs. So more details about that can be found in our weekly email. Uh, we also have a number of uh, events tied into our NURSE 50th anniversary celebration. Um, specifically, we're having our NURSE users annual meeting this October 22nd through 24th at uh, in Berkeley and at Berkeley Lab in the Residence Inn. So we're hoping that uh, many people will be able to join us and participate to celebrate 50 years of science and 50 years moving forward. We also have a number of uh, um, other competitions and events that will be announced over the summer, starting with our 50th anniversary science as art competition. So if you have some type of cool uh, animation or image um, from calculations performed at NURSE, we encourage you to submit it in our science as art competition. Uh, more details about that can be found in our weekly uh, email that's sent out every Monday. And then we're also hoping that you'll be able to join us throughout the summer for our 50th anniversary seminar series. And our next uh, talk will be on June 24th as well. Okay, any, actually any questions about those nurse updates or anything? Uh, can we use any AI? and machine learning stuff to create an art for competition? Well, I think the goal is to create it from work that you've done on computations, uh, calculations using Perlmuter at NURSE. So it's kind of like a artistic rendering of your, your work or results. Oh, okay. That's my understanding, but um, I will pose that question to our committee as well. I was, trying, I was just trying to cheat, so no, no <laughs> serious question. No serious question. Well, you know, just you're just using taking advantage of technology. Let's That's let's right. frame it that way. <laughs> Thank you. Any other uh, comments or questions about those updates? Okay. Uh, additionally, we also have a number of trainings that are occurring. Uh, Specifically, we, we, we have uh, nurse Perlmuter office hours in June and July. Uh, please be sure to consult uh, the weekly email as well as calendar for those specific dates that occur. You're able to drop in with any specific questions that you might have on your applications or using Perlmuter and get live one-on-one -on -one help with uh, a number of nurse staff and consultants. So it's a good opportunity for you to just drop in if you have questions that you want to get some live assistance with. We also have a number of uh, training events. We have our OpenMP training series that is occurring as well. 
Uh, we've already had two sessions within the series, the third session on optimizing um, using NUMA and SM SIMD is planned for Monday, July 10th. Please be sure to refer to our training webpage for that, as well as a weekly email. Next week, NURSE will be hosting a crash course on supercomputing that is a part of our training and seminar series for the 2024 Berkeley Lab Com Computational Science and Summer Student Program. So this training is open to all NURSE users as well as OLCF and ALCF users as well. So this is geared towards anyone that is fairly new to parallel programming and supercomputing. Um, just with a expectation of prior programming experience and using compiled languages. So it's a, a great opportunity if you're looking for a refresher on some things related to uh, parallel programming. Um, we also have the NCORE uh, WRF tutorial um, going July 15th through the 19th. So the weather research and forecasting tutorial um, is going to be online and you can register for that. Um, directly, and it can be found, uh, links to register in our weekly email. And one more, um, one more uh, training that is also occurring is you can register for the um, August Lawrence Livermore National Lab uh, HPC Innovation Center tutorial. Um, this is just a, a series of uh, tutorials aimed at open source HPC software products that are going to be hosted by Livermore Lab. And so all are welcome to join. Um, it could include definite potential topics of interest to our, our user community. Uh, and again, we also have uh, the International Workshop on Performance, Portability, and Productivity in HPC. It has its calls for participation for papers open. The workshop will be held in conjunction with SC24 occurring uh, the workshop will be Monday, November 18th uh, at SC24 in Atlanta, Georgia. So again, for all of these uh, announcements, calls for participation, you can find them in the weekly email. So we hope you all are reading them and uh, staying up to date on all of the amazing uh, events that are occurring. Did we have any uh, questions about uh, the calls for participation, trainings, or any of the other nurse updates? Okay, all right, awesome. Well, we will continue on. Okay, and so next up we have our topic of the day and we have a few science talk um, presentations from our speaker who is a postdoctoral fellow here at Nurse, um, McCall, Dave. Uh, McCall, how are you doing? Are you ready to go? Yeah, absolutely, I'm ready to go. Okay, awesome. Well, let me allow for you to start sharing. Very excited about your talks today. Thank you for facilitating everything. It's uh, useful to get the work out there and hopefully see some feedback and interactions from the users too, so. Excellent. Um, all right, and uh, so I assume you can see my full slide, right? Um, okay, so hello to all the attendees. What uh, I'm going to first talk about uh, my specific application that I worked on for a year doing some performance engineering. Um, and then I will dig into CUDA aware MPI since that is one of the topics that I explored during my work. Um, so my specific application is wind energy simulations. And I'll, I'll point out some observations and interventions that I made for the performance engineering for uh, this work. As far as questions are concerned, I think Charles mentioned, so I, I think this one is supposed to be a more interactive meeting. So be, please feel free to uh, interject, especially in the second presentation, which is supposed to be more of a discussion rather than a one-sided talk. Uh, so feel free to unmute. Um, Charles, if you see something in the chat that, that is pressing, let, let me know and I can stop and answer it. Awesome. Um, all right. So 
wind farm simulations uh, need atmospheric de data as initial and boundary conditions, right? Why? Because now we see these huge wind turbines and, you know, sp spread over tens of kilometers, right? Uh, at this point, we are pretty good at uh, simulating a single wind turbine that is facing a nice uniform kind of a flow. Um, but if we want to more effectively simulate a whole wind farm, we need to simulate the atmosphere around it and, and consider that for the wind turbine environment itself. We also want to often uh, simulate the in interactions between the different wind turbines. As you can see, some of the wind turbines lie in the wake of the other turbines. So to do this, we need to have this atmospheric data as initial and boundary conditions. So there is the mesoscale, uh, to, uh, this is a terminology used in atmospheric flow simulations. The mesoscale, this is a scale at which storms occur, uh, tens to hundreds of kilometers. And then there is the micro scale wind turbine environment, right? And the process of downscaling or filtering down the flow features from the meso scale to the micro scale is uh, called as uh, downscaling. Now, it is important that the physics that are important, uh, you know, for the turbine performance, such as the turbulent kinetic energy, for example, are captured correctly during this downscaling process. And uh, this is where this energy research and forecasting or ERF, we also call it ERF, uh, the ERF, ERF code comes in and bridges the scale gap between the mesoscale and the microscale, right? Um, it is supposed to be an alternative to the weather research and forecasting model, a, a GPU enabled alternative to the weather research and forecasting model. Uh, it prioritizes accurate, uh, accurate prediction of these low level winds that are consequential for wind turbine performance. Um, provides models uh, for offshore complex terrains and so on. Um, programmatically, it is based upon this AMRX framework that provides this block structured mesh uh, capability with adaptive mesh refinement. And this, as you can imagine, helps with, with this when you are, especially when you're working with these uh, multiple length scales going from the meso scale to the micro scale. As you go finer and fi finer, you can imagine having uh, a dynamically uh, refining the mesh as you go near the turbine or as you go near the flow feature, such as the wake coming in from the turbine. Uh, so AMRX is the framework that provides advanced data structures and memory management for uh, this block structured meshes. Uh, it also provides the interface for parallelism over CPUs and GPUs, which we will certainly talk about later on. Now, the ultimate question is when it comes to performance engineering is how can we run the simulations faster? And you, you notice that I'm using the word performance engineering rather than optimization, because oftentimes when we think about performance, we first think about this kind of an approach that I uh, that you see at the top here, where we first do a overall system profiling or a timeline profiling of the application, we find out the bottlenecks uh, in the application that is the kernels or the subroutines that are taking the most time. And then we zero in on those kernels uh, to do some very detailed optimization. So in terms of NVIDIA GPUs, you might use like inside systems and inside compute to, to do these kind of uh, things. But what if communication cost is overwhelming and like uh, is the actual bottleneck rather than the computation, right? Uh, in this case, uh, the other two approaches to performance and engineering can be these systemic, systemic changes to the data structures or memory management or say optimal runtime settings. A very simple example is determining what is the optimal number of processes to run on to, you know, uh, to balance the communication overhead with the benefit that we are getting. So when uh, communication is uh, the main bottleneck, these kind of approaches can have a significant boost to your performance. So on the same lines uh, of reducing the communication costs, uh, I will present like a some observations or interventions that I made during my work with the Earth code. And all this work is heavily directed and guided by the core Earth uh, developer team here at the Center for Computational Sciences and Engineering at Berkeley Lab. 
Um, and so I'll talk about this OpenMP uh, for CPU, uh, for parallelism over CPUs and how the scaling looks for that. And then the GPU aware MPI. And then finally, communication buffers and how we handle the memory pool for that on GPUs. And I will, of course, uh, explain some of these terms along the way. So first, let me just overall describe um, the parallelism strategy that AMRX, the base framework, uses. Um, so it uses this MPI plus X strategy for parallelism, where MPI, that is a message passing interface, is used for this explicit transfer of data and distributing work among the different processes, right? So for example, uh, here, you see two different uh, grids, uh, the square ones, that can be assigned to two different MPI processes, zero and one, right? And then for parallelism over CPU in AMRX, you can use OpenMP to uh, do further parallelism uh, for the specific grid. For example, there is the blue region here in the grid and the orange region in the grid, which AMRX calls tiles. And both of those individually can be worked upon by two different OpenMP threads um, that are assigned to that process. And uh, as, all, as many of you may know, uh, the multiple threads can access the same memory space on the node. That is what we call shared memory parallelism. And that is how we save on the intra-node communication cost. Now, uh, the question is, uh, how many threads should be assigned to a process, right? That is like a scaling question that we often talk about when we start doing production runs. So here, for example, I have the a simple atmospheric boundary layer simulation with the Earth code. And I'm using two Perlmutter compute nodes, that is 256 physical cores, which I keep constant. So on one extreme is just using one thread per MPI process on the left and using 256 MPI processes in total. And as you go to the right, you keep decreasing the number of MPI process, but you increase the number of open MPI threads and the number of cores that you are using per MPI process, right? And so as it turns out, this four to eight open MPI threads uh, turns out as the sweet spot, giving us like a 33% reduction in wall time as compared to just using MPI processes. And as you may imagine, this is a stencil code. So what happens when you increase more threads is that you start incurring the synchronization costs as you need to synchronize fre frequently the OpenMP threads because you are essentially reaching across the uh, stencil boundaries to uh, get the data. Now, coming from CPUs to GPUs, um, you know, uh, this is a rough number of uh, with the simple atmospheric boundary layer simulations without IO or diagnostics. It provides like a 30, for example, a 30 times speed up on GPU nodes using the GPU, using just the GPUs as compared to using all the CPUs, right? Which is great. But we always want to uh, run faster and make optimal use of uh, the GPU hardware that we have on hand, right? Um, so the strategy that AMREX uses is this MPI plus X again, but now X is CUDA, HIP, or SICL for the GPUs based on the target vendor for the GPU that you want to run on, right? So each MPI process works with a single GPU, and then each GPU thread works on a single mesh cell, right? So since we want to make, uh, make the optimum use of resources uh, and run faster, um, what happens with these higher uh, throughput computations on GPUs is that communication between GPUs reveals as much more of a bottleneck uh, for uh, when we are using GPUs. Um, and so if we can speed up this communication between GPUs, the data transfer between GPUs, that can have a significant effect. Um, this is where GPU aware comes uh, GPU aware MPI comes in. And I will obviously cover this in much more detail in my next uh, talk. Uh, but essentially what it does is that it bypasses the host and instead of and can directly transfer the data between one GPU to the other. And so what it does is that it, uh, it reduces the wall time significantly uh, while scaling up. So for example, here, the blue line is without GPU aware MPI. Again, this is weak scaling for the APL simulations. So as I increase the number of GPUs, 
I proportionately increase the problem size, right? So without GPU aware MPI, you can see a big jump in the wall time going from one GPU to four GPUs. Those are all within a node. And then we see this nice ideal weak scaling curve. Uh, with the orange line with GPU aware MPI, you see much less of a jump going from one GPUs to four GPU within a node. And then you see another jump going to the multiple uh, nodes um, and then this nice scaling and uh, giving at least like a 20% reduction in wall time um, over multiple nodes, scaling to about 32 nodes here. So um, the next thing I, I'd like to talk about are communication buffers, right? So uh, a lot of these applications, production applications that use GPUs, or even if they don't use GPUs, they use communication buffers for transferring data from one process to the other. There are multiple advantages to using communication uh, buffers. One big thing here, for example, is data aggregation, right? Um, that reduces the communication latency. For example, let's see where you have this three-dimensional grid that resides on an AMRX process, right? Um, now, say we want to communicate this slice of data from, from one process to another. And I have also indicated the direction of contiguous data in memory uh, here. So as you can see that no data members in this slice uh, lie contiguously in memory. So if we were to just transfer the data as is, we, we have to uh, do a lot of manipulations with the MPI data types or transfer each uh, cell individually, which is obviously not feasible. And so what AMRX does is that it aggregates all this data into a single contiguous one-dimensional buffer uh, and hence saving communication latency costs. Another trick that a lot of these production application does and uh, do and AMRX also does is this concept of a pre-allocated memory pool on the GPU that is called uh, an arena in by AMRX. But what it essentially does is that it pre-allocates a bunch of memory on the device, on the GPU, and keeps track of what portions of that memory pool are being used by the different application buffers, right? Um, and so here uh, I'm calling it the device arena. And what we observe for a specific application is that when the same device arena, the pre-allocated memory pool was being shared by the simulation data buffers um, and the communication buffers. So simulation data buffers is velocity, density, whatever you need. And the communication buffers are what I just showed in the last slide that uh, the degraded performance uh, for a specific application, right? When we, imp when we implemented a separate communication uh, arena or a memory pool for the communication buffers that uh, mitigated this degradation in performance. And the hypothesis uh, by uh, one of the core developers of AMRX region is that um, when we do this, uh, when we do this, we are using the same uh, pointer address for uh, the MPI buffer that is to be sent that uh, saves, that doesn't require re-registering the pointer during subsequent calls and hence saves the uh, performance from degradation. So in summary, I covered these three different uh, strategies you can call to reduce communication costs and talking about the sweet spot for open MP threads, uh, enabling direct data transfers between GPUs by GPU aware MPI, which is what I'm going to go into detail in the next talk, and then implementing, the, implementing this distinct memory pool for communication buffers on the GPU. And noting that these have a more significant impact than uh, detail, potentially ha have a more significant impact than detailed profiling. Uh, although I and uh, I should stress that this is not like a clean classification because sometimes until you do a detailed profiling, you cannot find certain systemic uh, issues with the data layout or the memory management. And uh, so I just wanted to give a sneak peek into what's going next for this uh, kind of the atmospheric modeling code uh, that is more oriented towards wind energy. Uh, there is a new energy earthshot research center by the Department of Energy called FLOMAS, which stands for Floating Offshore Wind Modeling and Simulation, that aims to create an ecosystem around these modeling and simulation tools that are relevant for uh, offshore wind energy, right? So 
specifically the earth code is uh you know in beta testing and it, and the developer team continues to add new features um and testing it and new optimizations but one of the goals is to do a runtime uh, coupling of this earth atmospheric modeling code which solves the compressible navier stokes equations with the amr wind or exa wind solver that solves the incompressible flow equations for uh, the flow just around the turbine. And so I'm currently working on this two-way runtime that is in, in memory coupling between these two different code pieces that are both, both based on the AMRX framework. Um, so that is what I'm currently working on. And the view, the aim is to have both these codes work in lockstep with each other, run in lockstep with each other, resulting in more holistic wind farm simulations in the future. So with that, I'll end this portion of my presentation and, and take any questions. Uh, this not not a question, but a comment. Uh, really, thank you for the helpful information. Particularly, I'm, I've been using the open, the, in the CPU version, the Wolf model, and I tried OpenMP threads, and then I was getting Similar number of as you did in you know, OpenMP three four to eight was better, and I was wondering why. And then from your presentation, I understand why having more uh, open OpenMP three doesn't really help. So really nice, and I'm really excited for this new model coming, uh, in, and maybe we can use those uh, research applications as well. So yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I'm I'm glad it was helpful to understand it. It's essentially because you have the the different grid portions are assigned to different threads, but because it's a stencil code, you know, finite difference, uh, it it needs to reach across the stencil uh, the thread area boundaries, and because it's reaching across, we need to synchronize often. And uh, if you use keep adding more number of threads, then the synchronization cost will take over essentially. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. I believe there there seems to be another question by James. Hi. Uh, sorry, this is uh, probably a naive question because I don't have experience with a uh, hybrid parallel computing with multi-threading. Although I've tried it with multi-processing, but um, it sounds like uh, when you're talking about um, adding multi-threading and saying that you're getting a performance boost, um. So generally, I would think of uh, you would want to add multi-threading if you have um, your uh, your overall task divided into some sort of task groups, smaller task groups, and then you uh, within each group you have multi-threading. But it doesn't sound like that's what you're talking about. It sounds like you're saying uh, you're using the exact same task division that uh, that you would have if you didn't have any multi-threading at all. And then I guess it's the OpenMP framework. Uh, it's just uh, when you add uh, or increase multi-threading or something um, or specify it at at a uh, at the sweet spot, uh, as you said, then uh, you get a performance boost uh, with the same exact tax divisions, and it's just going to sort of um, <clears throat> filter them into into uh, threads somehow uh, automatically. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. You you're uh, if I understood correctly, you're correct in the sense that. Um... Ultimately, what we are doing is dividing, you know, since we are dealing with block structured mesh, for example, we are just making, for example, you can think of it simplistically as making smaller cubes, right, to work for, to give work to the threads or, or doing the grouping, uh, you know, as you would. So, for example, if I'm using four threads per process, right? Technically, I will, you, you might be say, you might say that, okay, normally, with one process, whatever I would uh, be assigning the the data region, I would assign four times the data region, and then you know have it work with four cores, and then subdivide the data region into four different you know regions in a, in that sense. So in that sense, you are right that you are doing that similar kind of task grouping, but uh, you do need to put in special functionalities to for the synchronizations, right? Because what happens is this, since you are working with a shared memory model, the benefit comes in because you are you no longer need to explicitly transfer data from one thread to another, right? But you also need to be wary about this uh, synchronization, right? Because now you can 
the different threads can step on each other's feet, right? If you think about it like that. So you do need to put in those kinds of functionalities. So it's not, it wouldn't be as simple as that, just doing finer decomposition and then assigning it to threads uh, in that sense. But uh, yes, essentially you are working here with um, data regions and figuring out what is the right balance between the synchronization cost and the communication cost. Makul, could I add something that might be helpful? Yeah, absolutely. So, so James, I'm not sure if I'm understanding your question, but I think what might be helpful is so we define the, the things that he showed that are like grids or boxes, and those get assigned to processes. If you're going to use OpenMP, you can subdivide those into tiles, and the tiles are just logical tiles. And so if you have one grid and you want to use four OpenMP threads, you'll break that grid into four OpenMP tiles, but tiles know that they're in the shared memory space. If you're doing four MPI, you would have to have four separate grids who know that they need to communicate with MPI. So I think... I. I think maybe the the phrase logical tiles is the piece that was missing. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Okay, awesome. I guess you can continue on to your second talk then. All right. So, um, okay. I think um, this one um, is supposed to be even more of a discussion rather than a presentation because um, if if I have to say the timeline, for example, because to work with uh, while working with the Earth code and making it run on Perlmutter, I came across a concept of CUDA where MPI and it's it had been a while since I came back to the world of HPC, so understanding how GPU data transfers can happen and things like that. I started digging into it, how to make it run on Perlmutter. After that, I we did a, an AMRX tutorial in March. For that, I dig, dug in further to see how things work. And then finally decided to present this to NERSC users because uh, we have seen some interest in NERSC users on using CUDA where MPI or direct GPU GPU transfers. Um, and so we, I, I thought that it might be nice to present this to at the NUC call and see what the experience of other users has been with CUDA where MPI or such technologies on Perlmutter uh, and see if there is a significant interest to, you know, further dig into it by NUS, you know, by, for example, in, uh, collaborating with NUS staff and so on. Um, and, uh, so, okay, let, let's move forward on uh, this topic on CUDA where MPI on Perlmutter. Um, so as I, as I mentioned in, in my previous like uh, talk, which was more kind of focused on the science is that, you know, we have this higher computational throughput on GPUs, but uh, which which a lot of times gives us speed up by doing simple, uh, by simply by offloading work to the GPUs, right? In some cases, but we, the idea is to use as much of the hardware as possible, right? The idea is to make optimum use of the hardware to get, you know, at as much speed up as we can, right? Then that's what we all would like to do, right? And as I mentioned, communication between GPUs becomes a major bottleneck because of this high throughput. Um, and so, for example, I have an example timeline here at the bottom where you know, no single computational kernel in your application may be taking more than 5% or 10% of your time if you're talking of a very complicated application. Um, but cumulatively, communication might be taking up like 30% of your time, just as an example. And, and, and that is where, you know, even if you accelerate communication by 10, 20% of uh, um, a factor, then that can help you with the overall performance significantly. So this is where CUDA aware MPI comes in, which makes GPU GPU communication easier to program and potentially more efficient or more performant. So I will cover what is CUDA aware MPI, uh, starting with the basics, and then how can it accelerate communication between GPUs? How do you enable it on Perlmutter? What is the performance ex benefit that you may expect? Um, and I should obviously uh, acknowledge the guidance uh, that I have received from 
several nurse staff members here, uh, Daniel, Kevin, Brandon. And then I should say that a lot of this content and many of the images are directly uh, kind of inspired from um, this technical blog by an NVIDIA staff member that introduces CUDA aware MPI and you should check it out if, if, if you all are interested in the topic. And then finally, a disclaimer that I am not a communication libraries uh, person, an expert, or an expert in networking. So a lot of these topics were also new to me. So I think this one, especially feel free to, um, if some of you know more than what I am presenting here, and if you think it, it will be interesting or useful to the other users, please make sure to interject and, and provide your inputs or ask questions to the to the others. And at the end of the talk, I will, I'm certainly interested in knowing what all of your uh, impression is about CUDA Aware MPI, whether you have used it on Perlmutter, how much you know about it, whether you would like to use it, whether your application use it, uh, so on. So let's get started with the basics, right? Uh, and the memory model, right? So we know that uh, GPUs and CPUs have distinct um, memories, right? Uh, work with different distinct um, memory hardware and have a, hence have distinct memory spaces originally, as you can see here on the left. So if you're dealing with data buffers on the CPU and you want to do some work with it on the GPU, um, you know, originally what you would end up doing, you know, this is when CUDA was initially came out, you would transfer the D GPU buffers explicitly to the GPU memory. Sorry, you would explicitly transfer the CPU data buffers to the GPU for working with that, right? At some point, CUDA came up with the unified virtual addressing that you see here on the right, where the CPU memory and the GPU memory appear to the application as a single virtual address space, right? And that is how, for example, CUDA can do managed memory buffers if you are aware of that concept. And the UVA or unified virtual addressing is also how CUDA can do CUDA aware MPI. And so this is what it looks like, right? Uh, with, with this CUDA aware MPI. And so at the top, without CUDA aware MPI, as I mentioned, you would end up explicitly transferring a buffer from say, uh, that is residing on the GPU. You would transfer it first to the CPU. So that is why you see the device to host flag here. Then you would send it using MPI. And then the other rank after receiving it will have to explicitly transfer the buffer to the GPU. Now with GPU aware MPI, you can simply provide the GPU buffers to the MPI calls, right? The MPI sends and receives here and the MPI interface will know what to do at the backend to bring the data from GPU zero to GPU one, for example, right? Um, and of course, as you can see, this is easier to program, but what about performance? Can it help with performance? So there are other technologies that NVIDIA introduced along the line using which, um, so originally, even if you did uh, just the send and receive uh, with GPU aware MPI, what it originally what it had to do was to first stage the buffer on the CPU memory, right? Uh, at the back end, even though the application developer, the application does not have to do it, but the at the back end, the MPI library along with CUDA would have to first stage the data buffer on the system memory, and then it would go to the other GPU or to the network, right? But using these technologies, uh, the data buffer can directly go from the memory of one GPU to another within the node, or if you are talking about multiple nodes, then it can go from the memory of one GPU to the network, right? And then ultimately, obviously, to the other GPU that resides on some other node. Uh, on Perlmutter, of course, we have like the HPE Slingshot 11 network uh, that, that does this. And so, of course, this reduces the number of hops that the data has to do go, going from one GPU to another, saving on latency costs, for example. Um, just a recap on the architecture of a Perlmutter GPU node. A Perlmutter GPU node has four A100 GPUs, as a lot of you uh, would readily know. 
and has four network cards. So NIC stands for network interface cards that are then connected, of course, to the Slingshot 11 network, right? So the four GPUs, uh, so you can see using this command, um, when you are on a compute node, you can use this command, for example, NVIDIA SMI topography to get the topography. You can see that all the GPUs within a node are connected with each other using NVLink, uh, the NVLink interface. More importantly, what I'd like you to point, uh, like to point out here is that um, focus your uh, focus on how the GPUs um, relate to the closest NUMA domains for the CPUs, right? The CPU GPU affinities. So, for example, the GPU zero is closest to the NUMA domain three. Uh, the GPU one to domain two, two to one, and so on. So it's like a reverse order. So keep that in mind while uh, going forward. So what do you need to enable GPU aware MPI or CUDA aware MPI on Perlmutter? So if you are using the Cray compiler wrappers, right? If you are using those uh, at compile time, me you have to make sure to give it uh, the accelerator target using the environment variable that I uh, mentioned here at the top. And then at runtime, make sure that mpitch GPU support enabled flag is turned on, right? So that gray mpitch knows that you will be passing in GPU buffers to, you know, to the MPI calls and is able to handle it at, at the back end. Note that these are actually set by default on Perlmutter, but you have to be aware about this because sometimes users can do, for example, module purge or things like that, where they might accidentally unset these things. And that can cause errors. For example, if you try to use GPU aware MPI, but you don't have this flag set uh, at runtime or at compile time, that can give you errors. Or if you are using an application that uses GPU aware MPI, but you are not setting these things, right? Uh, so those things are set by default, but what you do need to keep in mind while doing uh, the slurm batch job uh, script or doing the interactive script is to not do the binding between CPU and GPU using slurm, right? Because slurm doesn't work well with the CUDA intra-process communication layer that, that this GPU aware MPI uh, uses. So sometimes, for example, users might do GPUs per task, right? Equals one, for example, or equals two. Um, what that does is that it does that implicit binding, which then doesn't work well with GPU over MPI. So here, for example, you know, it can be beneficial to add this GPU bind equals none flag that makes it explicitly clear to the Slurm uh, job that please do not mine my CPUs, GPUs uh, via Slurm, right? I'll do it manually. And what do I mean manually? You can use like a wrapper script, for example, here I'm using like a wrapper batch script. You can write up a different file or you can do it within your batch job like I'm doing it here. Uh, and I'm using the CUDA visible devices environment variable to set the affinities. But you can also do it within your code itself instead of doing it in your bad job if you don't want to do it here. And then finally, you'll see this three minus slurm local ID. And this is where I'm doing like the reverse ordering, right? Which is supposed to be the optimal one. Uh, that is GPU zero to be uh, assigned to process three, GPU one assigned to process uh, two and, and so on. Uh, and then finally, to close this triangle of affinities uh, between the CPU, the GPU, and the network card, uh, I'm specifying this mpitch NIC policy equals GPU that will pick the closest network card to the GPU that is assigned to the process, uh, right? And that will close this triangle of affinities between the three things. Uh, so some of the things are, op for example, if you do the binding correctly, and if you don't mention this GPU flag, that might work. Uh, that might still do the same thing. Or if you don't, uh, mention uh, any S batch binding, you don't really need this GPU bind equals none flag, but I like to include these things anyways to make it really explicit to whoever is reading the script of what is going on. Um, so if you want to read further about these settings, you can always go to the S batch doc documentation or the Cray mpitch documentation and read further, right? Um, so this is all about the affinities. 
And so, as I mentioned in my previous talk, what ends up happening is by doing this direct GPU GPU communications, you well going to the multi within the node and also going to multiple nodes, you save on the communication costs. Um, you so I should note that this data is has a lot of uh, factors going into like the difference. So when you're not, when I say I'm not doing GPU aware MPI, I'm also tr explicitly transferring, for example, data from uh, the GPU to the communication buffers, which are on the CPU, right? And so that is one hop and then the communication happens. Whereas with GPU aware MPI, uh, it is directly able to send the data from the communication buffers with her on the GPU to the other GPU, right? Um, one common question that I have uh, when I talk about some uh, about this with some people is that how do I really know that it's doing this direct GPU GPU communication, right? Like how do I know it's doing what it's supposed to do, right? Um, and one way I have found is by when you if you profile it by Insight Systems, then these direct GPU communications will show up as a separate category. So if you have the memory copy profiling, uh, memory profiling turned on, then these direct GPU communications will show up as P2P mem copies in addition to the normal H2D that is the host to device or the device to device or the device to host memory copies. So P2P, uh, just to be clear, means peer to peer, right? Um, so it will show up separately, but there might be other ways out there to really check this or intercept these uh, data transfers and like look into those. So if if anyone knows something else, then then feel free to uh, provide that input. So yeah, that's that's all I have known about CUDA aware MPI. Uh, and um, in summary, it allows transferring GPU buffers through MPI, but using these special technologies. Not only it allows transferring GPU buffers through MPI, it also enables uh, removing this extra hops in between and hence can accelerate uh, your communication performance. Um, on Perlmutter currently, it does, uh, you do have to uh, be careful about how you set the affinities. You do not let slums set the affinities between CPU and GPU, but you do it like manually uh, using a wrapper script or in your code. I should also mention that this also applies to these new next uh, communication libraries like Envish Mem or Nickel uh, for GPU communication. So even for those, these kind of affinity settings do um, uh, apply. And then finally, there are updates in Slurm that allow C groups to work well with the CUDA IPC layer. And so maybe in the future, we may not, uh, you know, the users may not be needing, users may not need to like worry about these complexities and, or the complexity may get re reduced and we can simply do the binding via Slurm that might be possible in the future, but that is up to like being tested and, and so on, all those uh, disclaimers. Um, but in general, if you have, uh, obviously you have questions, you can always contact NERSC or if you have feedback on what kind of performance that you are, seeing with CUDA where MPI, you, you can reach out. Um, but right now too, I mean, does, does anyone have any thoughts on this? Like, did you, did you learn something new in this talk that you did not know early, uh, earlier about GPU where MPI? Do you know if your application uses this and, uh, were you, are you curious about like kind of enabling it in the future? Or if you are an application developer, have you used it? Um, and if so, what's been your experience? Yeah, I, I see that there are some comments in the chat. Uh, what is the performance comparison with optimal affinity and something that is not optimal? Uh, uh, Mahesh asked. That is a really good question because, um, um, and that is a really good question because you use, I, I wrote optimal affinity in italics because that is supposed to be within quotes. So th this is supposed to be optimal because, you know, the way the things are, the, the, the way the actual hardware is laid out, as you saw in that topography, uh, this is supposed to be the optimal thing. 
But what I've found with, for example, with Earth, is that simply not doing the binding and you know is is enough right to get the good performance bump and then putting in that optimal settings additional optimal settings doing the reverse ordering and, and so on didn't make uh, that much of a difference doesn't make much difference so this is supposed to be the optimal one but maybe the difference might show up with other kinds of applications that is another thing that i want to warn about is that the application that i showed was like a stencil code which has a very specific like data layouts and things like that, or, or very specific uh, computation, communication interactions. So other kinds of applications, for example, machine learning or something, so things like that, might see different kind of performance benefits from this, right? So it, it that is why I'm asking for feedback, right? Like what is your performance look like and so on. So yeah, that, that, is, my, that is my answer on like optimal versus maybe not optimal, right? Thanks. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. <laughs> uh, there's just a uh, comment on from Noha about how not using GPU bind equals none creates some problems. That that is why I like using it, right? Because uh, if you don't specify anything, Slurm is not supposed to do the binding. But sometimes you you might end up doing certain things in Slurm which you for example, GPUs per task, right? It might seem like you are just telling it how many GPUs you want, right? But actually it is doing an implicit binding, right? So if you do GPU bind equals none, um, you know, it overrides that and, and makes sure that there is no binding. How, how about the others? Even if, even if you don't have... Uh, any current experience with CUDA where MPI? Did you know about this information before or, or is it relevant to you? For me, it's definitely a lot of um, great information. One um, question I do have related to um, managing uh, the memory or the data layout within the application and how that might affect uh, the CUDA aware MPI communication. Have you done any work on that? Um, further work on maybe like uh, doing uh, cache blocking or you know more specific uh, data optimizations on you know aggregating the block size down or trying to find the optimal size. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's a great question. But no, no, I have, I have not experimented with that. And you are right that those things might interact differently with. Mm -hmm. CUDA via with whether you're using CUDA where MPI or not using it because MPI might be doing in the back end different kind of pipelining, for example, for your messages and things like that. I'm sure there's a lot of complexity involved, but this is also not my research area mainly. So um, I, I have not looked into that. So do you, are there MPitch environment variables that would influence performance for CUDA where MPI is colored us? Um, not that I know of, not that I know of, but th there, there may be some specific settings or, or nothing that I have come across really. Yeah. Do you have any tips on debugging CUDA where MPI problems at the application level? Um, de debugging, especially when you have a combination of CUDA code or kernel code and, and communication, it can obviously be very complex to debug. Um, but I, I have not had experience. There might be other people who are like, who have, you know, for example, the AMREX code developers, like I know Vichan is, uh, knows a lot about uh, communication and MPI. So there might be others who might be better for that question. So maybe that can be a future topic for the NUG call. Like how do you do debugging for, uh, you know, when you have, you know, CUDA where MPI, but um, I don't have any specific tips of the top of my mind for, for debugging, except the usual ones that you use for other stuff. Um, okay, Noah said he, this is the first time he's heard about the reverse ordering. Um, and then the affinity, okay, um, I have opened that page and I will, um, if, if there is wrong information on the 
NAS docs for the affinity. I will point it out to the right people and see if, if it needs changing. Yes, please do. And we have, yeah. um, Bruce has his hand raised as well. Bruce, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I, I had a question about, uh, um, do you have any experience with, uh, so suppose you have a GPU that you've uh, allocated data from, uh, you know, say GPU zero and process zero, and then um, you uh, open a memory handle to that GPU from process one, and then try and do an MPI call from there. Um, do you have any experience with stuff like that and whether or not that, that kind of context switching um, seems to work uh, with the MPI? Right. So you're saying like one G a GPU is already working with a CPU process, right? And then you uh, you open up a memory handle from another process and then try to do MPI calls from there. Um, yeah. I No, I have no experience. Yeah. So, yeah. But I, I don't know if other users, any other users have had, you know, experience with that. Feel free to chime in. I will mention on Noah's comment on like the uh, the affinity is that the, if you do just like a one to one uh, binding, they may, that may not necessarily be a wrong incorrect thing because it, it can still do it as in your program won't stop working. But yes, uh, ideally it's supposed to be this reverse ordering. So um, if Especially that might matter when you are doing like directly communication from the GPU. And that is why I stressed on the reverse ordering. But say, for example, you're doing all your communication from buffers in the CPU, right? Then then that might not make as much of an effect. And you might be better off, for example, uh, binding your network card uh, so that it is closest to the NUMA domains rather than being closest. Rather, you will be better off binding the network card to the NUMA domains rather than to the GPUs, you know, is in terms of the distance. Um, okay. Um, okay. Someone says it will be put relevant with the summer research. And do you happen to know whether they use CUDA where MPI for training large language models? Actually, I feel like LLMs or training machine learning models in general is a big use case for like multi-node and multi-GPU communication. So I'm sure it's super relevant. And, uh, you know, especially I envision that when these new communication libraries like Nickel or Envishmem, they catch up, uh, they will be used more and more for machine learning uh, training or LLM training. And so these kind of things will become more and more relevant in those contexts. But we have other experts at NERSC, for example, doing machine learning training work and figuring out how to best lay out things on the nodes. Um, Peter Harrington and and um, is is one name that comes to mind. So yeah, you might reach out to them if you need more help. Okay, well, thank you uh, very much for uh, two wonderful and insightful talks. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the end of our hour. Uh, please note that uh, slides from today's talks, as well as will be posted today in video within one week. Um, thank you so much for such a wonderful talk. And uh, we look forward to having you speak again on any updates that you have in the future. Absolutely, yeah, thank you for having me. Awesome. Have a nice day. You too. Uh, thank you everyone for attending today's community call. Uh, stay tuned for our next calls that will be announced over the next couple of weeks. And in the meantime, please don't hesitate to reach out to uh, myself or any of the user engagement or community engagement group with any questions, um, concerns, or even recommendations for future community calls. Uh, one of them will definitely will focus on one related to uh, profiling and debugging in the future as well. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day and a happy week. Thank you. Bye. Bye.